Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our latest webinar. Today is entitled, What's the Deal? How the UK-EU Trade Agreement Affects Country of Origin Rules. Um, we're just waiting for attendees to log on. So um, just bear with us um, as that happens. Just keep an eye on, on, on numbers. Um, I can see at the bottom of my screen, there's still people um, logging on. So um, just bear with us while um, that happens. We'll give them just a few moments. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Robert Kappa. I'm head of the commercial team at Harris Clark Rickabies. And um, I also lead for us as a firm on our insight topics, uh, which includes um, Brexit, which is why I'm chairing the um, webinar this morning for us. Um, so it looks to me like numbers are now fairly stable. Oh, there's a few more people coming in. Just give them a, a moment. Yeah, it, look, it, looks, it, looks, it looks like we're there. It looks like we've, we've got a full complement. So um, welcome again this morning. Um, thank you for joining us for our latest webinar entitled, What's the Deal? How the UK-EU Trade Agreement Affects Country of Origin um, Rules. As I said just now, my name is Robert Kappa. I'm your chair for the morning. I'm head of the commercial team here at Harris Black Rickabies and also lead for our uh, insight topics, which include um, Brexit. Um, the team this morning um, is working in conjunction with the Gloucestershire Growth Hub uh, and the surrounding LEPs of, of obviously Gloucestershire, Swindon and Wiltshire, and also uh, West of England. And we've been asked particularly to talk today about country of origin rules, which they're seeing increasing questions from their um, clients about, as indeed um, are we as a law firm. And I'd ask you to bear with us today as we are broadcasting remotely. Um, you can see that the four of us are all in different locations, um, which gives us a number of challenges for, for sound and everything else. So please bear with us if it's not our usual um, level of delivery. And um, the format today is live Q&A. Um, we have had some questions coming in advance, um, which we'll use some of those certainly to kick off the um, Q&A session. Um, but otherwise, um, if you can use the chat facility at the bottom of your screens um, and um, put in any questions that you might have, um, the questions are anonymized. So please feel free to um, put whatever questions you want in there. Um, uh, and you know, I will be monitoring those questions as we're going through, through the uh, webinar and, and pulling out the more interesting ones um, for you. If afterwards you've got any questions that are unanswered that are of particular interest, I know our speakers will be more than happy to take those questions um, directly from you. So please don't hesitate to get in touch, in touch with them. Um, before we go any further this morning, I would be remiss not to um, give Toby Waller, one of the advisors from the um, Gloucestershire Growth Hub, uh, an opportunity to um, say a few words about the webinar this morning. Um, um, so Toby, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Toby uh, yeah, Toby Waller. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm from the Growth Hub in Gloucestershire. Um, I'm part of a team of advisors whose job it is to help businesses in the county deal with the challenges and opportunities of the exit by the UK from the European Union. Uh, this is the first in a series of webinars uh, taking place throughout February and March. It's also part of the support package we're offering businesses in Gloucestershire. Everything is fully funded, which means there is no cost to you if you become involved. This includes any legal advice on confidential queries that you might require from the team at Harrison Clark Rickaby um, Solicitors. If there are any financial questions, moreover, we have also engaged the accountancy firm Hazelwood to provide support. We also have po podcasts prepared by business experts, which is forthcoming, and there are plenty of resources available on the Growth Hub website. There is further support from the Swindon and Wiltshire LEP and West of England LEP, who are partners on this project, as Robert mentioned. If you'd like to get in contact, please use the email eutransition at thegrowthhub.biz. Um, please note the team from HCR will include details of how to contact in their follow-up email. Today's webinar, um, as mentioned, is how the UK EU trade agreement affects country of origin rules. I'm delighted now to hand back to Robert um, with Hannah and Nicholas Grauferman to take questions. Robert, over to you. 
Thank you, um, and thank you, Toby, and uh, thank you to uh, to you and your colleagues at the Gloucestershire Growth Hub, uh, and also the wider LEPT across the southwest for inviting us to um, take part this morning in this in this, this uh, webinar on country of origin rules. So um, I can see there's a few questions coming in, which is great. But let's kick off with the, uh, the obvious question this morning. Um, so perhaps one for Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas is our head of international. Um, Nicholas. Um, why do we need the rules of origin? Uh, so, it's a good question. We need them uh, in order to get the preferential tariffs. So, without clarifying that the product originated in either the EU or the UK, uh, that we don't automatically get zero tariffs. So, that was part of the whole negotiation regarding the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, was to ensure that we could get UK goods zero tariff, and that's effectively been achieved. And then the difficulties, of course, how do you show that these goods really did originate uh, in the assigned regions? And of course, the, it starts to become more complicated when you have composite goods partly made outside the EU um, and then put together in the UK. That's one very complex issue, which I don't think we can resolve actually at the moment. And the other is, of course, the round trip. So the rules of origin where something is made in the EU, and then shifted to the UK, and then sent back into the EU, you would assume that that would be zero tariffed. But as of December the 29th, the EU has said controversially that no, we're, we're going to consider that as not um, satisfying the rules of origin preference. Okay, thank you um, for that. Nicholas. Hannah, um, a question for you. Hannah is um, a sister in um, Nicholas's team. Uh, Hannah, um, how are the rules structured under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement? So the Trade and Cooperation Agreement with the EU has two levels of rules of origin. So there are general provisions um, and they cover the practical processes about how one applies for preferential tariffs and, and proof of origin. And then there's more specific product specific rules of origin. And these go into quite some detail about, about certain processes that um, different types of goods need to undergo in order to satisfy the rules of origin. So they go into a huge amount of detail and it's really important that everyone checks um, the specific rules of origin that apply to different products. Because, So for example, they, the rules of origin can be satisfied if goods are ho wholly obtained in, in the EU or the UK. Um, and that means like products that um, don't come into contact with anything mm. outside of the UK or the EU. So examples of that would include animals that are born and raised um, in the country or minerals extracted from, from the soil, so it doesn't come into contact with anything else. But in addition to that, there are also rules of origin that require substantial transformation in the country. So that can be, and the, the rules in that are, go into a huge amount of detail. And that can either be specific processes that have to be undergone or just a certain amount of, um, of transformation. Um, so the, the trade and cooperation agreement covers all of this. And it also gives some detail about um, examples where work undergone won't be enough to satisfy the rules of origin. Um, and also certain um, tolerances that are permitted where a certain percentage of material and goods can be non-originating but still satisfy the rules of origin. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, Nicholas, um, what happens if products are made up in different countries comprising different components? How do the rules deal with that type of scenario? Yeah, it's, it, it can be very complex. I, uh, the um, category of product becomes relevant. So the extent, so for example, take something like a pen. The ink might come from China, but the pen itself is uh, made in the UK or the EU. That would ordinarily satisfy the rules of origin. But across the board, the way that a product is put together can differ massively. The um, gov.uk website, which I'll refer to a lot, uh, is, is incredibly helpful on that. Also, Europa, um, the EU equivalent from country to country, certain non-harmonized products have their own rules that differ from EU country to country. So it really matters where you're exporting. Uh, so that's a broad overview, which of course doesn't answer specifically the question for any particular product. Um, Hannah, did you have something to add to that or is that enough? Well, I, I'd just say 
again, I think it's really important to check the specific rules for the product. I think I'll keep going back to that point because um, different product codes will have different um, different percentages of non-originating material. So even if you know the manufacturing process involves parts from all over the world, depending on the rule applying to that product, it might still be it might still satisfy the rules of origin and qualify for preferential tariffs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for those um, answers. Um, a, a, a slightly different question, if I may. Um, when is a statement on origin used and how does that differ from a proof of origin? People have heard talk about mm -hmm. statements and proofs. So how does a statement of an origin um, differ from a proof of, of, of origin and, and when and how are the two used? That's very to the point because um you know, we've had to deal with these issues for certain clients. I mean, um, so there's the supplier's statement of origin, which actually doesn't need to be handed over um, at the border. That's the one that is wh whoever actually manufactured the goods. And of course, a lot of the time we're finding clients who, who see themselves as the exporter, and of course they are, um, and they see themselves as the supplier because it says on their contract, supply contract. But unhelpfully, the uh, trading corporation agreement follows general WTO practice and thinks of the supplier as being the person who actually manufactures. So you have to get the statement, of the um, supplier statement of origin from there, from the original manufacturer. You then hang on to it, self-declare, and then later on when the EU effectively is conducting an audit, so EU customs officials have the right to then audit uh, later in the year, so long after all your exports are then collated, and that's when the statement of origin is reviewed. If you don't have it, then effectively you lose that tariff right. So that's um, that, that's different to rules of origin that are declared when you're simply filling in a customs form. And that can be done, you know, if you think of it very, very practically, a truck is driving over a border and having to hand in a bunch of documents or show on the mobile phone or whatever document, whatever they've got, um, that they've ticked the right box. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Hello, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, just to add that a proof of origin can also be um, satisfied by um, importer's knowledge that's separate to the statement of origin. So rather than a statement of origin, if the importer based in the EU um, has evidence and supporting document documentation to satisfy or to prove the origin, then that can be used instead of the statement of origin. Okay, that that I think that that give, gives people a, a helpful overview. I want to just cover a few more sort of general uh, areas first of all before we start diving into specific questions that are coming from our um, attendees. Um, and and a, a question that um, has been posed um, before the um, webinar this morning is: Is it always advantageous to claim preferential tariffs? Nicholas, perhaps one for you. Well. I mean, you think so. So obviously, everyone wants to keep down their tariff amount as much as possible. So, you know, the automatic reaction is why would you, um, why would you consider not making that declaration and, and not even trying to get it? And of course, some of the time, the MFN tariff that would be imposed instead of zero tariff is still at 0%. So the way that you know, a customs, so this is more of an, an accountant's or a tax official's way of thinking of things is you are being tariffed, but you're being tariffed at zero is a bit different to not having a tariff imposed. And there may be advantages in, uh, in doing that. I mean, at, at the very least, in order to um, get the zero tariff benefit, as opposed to a not a, a, an MFN tariff, which is at zero percent, is that there's less work to do. You don't have to go to your lawyers or your import export agents or um, and get all that documents, which is which is really what's causing people difficulty at the moment. It's not that they're not entitled to the tariffs. It's just that people are holding up their hands and going, oh, my God, how do I fill in all these forms? Um, that's what's delaying products going into Ireland. It's not the fact that they might be tariffed. It's that people are having a difficult time filling in forms. And the same thing with the revenue systems around Europe. Uh, they don't have the right systems in place to even accept them. Uh, we can get onto that later, but there's been a lot of finger pointing. So that, that's one reason why you might not want to even bother. Okay, fine. Thank you for that, um, Nicholas. I think a couple of more general questions, first of all, before we start going into, into questions from um, our attendees. Um, and that is, um, 
Will the um, UK delay EU goods entering the UK and demand proof of preferential origin? We haven't yet. We've been a bit more relaxed about that than our friends in the EU. And part of that is because there's a six month delay um, in favor of getting imports from the EU. And it's recognized that um, nationally, we need stuff coming in more desperately than perhaps the EU needs our stuff getting over there. So that's why there's that six month delay before the procedures kick in. Uh, and it seems likely that generally the state of readiness that, you know, the various, the, the DIT, the FCO, the Home Office, everybody who's involved, uh, HMRC, is quite high. Uh, so they've, they've bought themselves that extra period of time to prepare all their forms, part of it. And the, the other part is perhaps the, the UK is quite good at getting these systems in place. You wouldn't think so to read the media, but that does, does seem to be. British companies have been, on average, much better prepared than, than European companies for dealing with this sort of difficulty. Uh, that's part of it. And I think that's thanks to the work of the DIT. I'm talking about going out. But I think yeah. by analogy, goods coming in would also benefit from that state of readiness. Okay, following on on that um, point about preferential origin, will goods lose their preferential origin status if they originate from the EU and, and are being re-exported from the UK back to the EU? Yeah, well, that's the, to me, kind of irritating thing is that this, um, in principle, they should be. Can see practically speaking it's exactly the same thing that came into the uk and then went back out again um but as of december the 29th the eu's guidance stated very clearly and required uh, revenues or tax offices around the eu to follow this guidance said that in that situation even if the goods so let's say you've got um a, a chocolate bar a kinder bueno manufactured in poland or france that's the two places it's manufactured, even though it's an Italian company. It comes into the UK, sits in a customs warehouse, goes straight back out again to another EU country. It's still going to the EU. The EU is treated as one entity for the purposes of the TCA. That same chocolate bar suddenly become, cannot get the right to the zero tariff. And you've got to ask, why did they issue this guidance? And we haven't been able to identify a clear legal basis for that. So far, however, uh, the British government hasn't sort of lobbied to say we don't think there's a legal basis they've lobbied on a political basis to say come on guys be fair without digging into the, the wording of the tca but that's the awkward situation we're in okay Hannah, you, you might have, Hannah's actually worked on um a client matter that relates to this so i'm not sure you might have something to add to that point yeah Hannah, do you want to add, do you want to add anything to that yeah, I just just to say, yeah, as you mentioned, Nicholas, I think a lot of um, retailers in the UK are lobbying against this. So, you know, we're hoping for clarification um, as it develops. But um, one solution we've been discussing that might relieve this is um, the use of like customs or bonded warehouses so that when goods come into the UK, they don't actually enter UK customs. So they're not considered to be leaving the EU. So they're, not, they're obviously not subject to tariffs when they re-enter the EU and leave the customs warehouse. Obviously, it's not going to be feasible for all businesses, but it might might be a solution. And so, and just sorry, we we keep answering this question back and forth, Robert. But I think it's an important one for people involved in this. It seems to affect so many people where they've been using the UK as a distribution centre, mm. and they're finding that they're effectively being steered into setting up a distribution yeah. centre in Frankfurt or something. And on that point about customs warehouses, in, in a way, that's. So that's what the problem is, is that it's people using custom warehouses and not adjusting the product at all. And what the EU is yeah. saying is when the goods come in from Poland, you now have to remanufacture, do something substantial to it to turn it into a UK only export. So they, they're not accepting that an EU product that goes through the UK without being touched um, can get zero tariff. They're effectively saying you now have to do something to it to make, a Brit make it a British product, which is quite counterintuitive. Okay. Well, I think that's given us enough of, sort of the background feel to the country of origin rules. Let's do a deep dive now into some of the questions from the uh, attendees. So the first question around um, dairy products uh, and exporting dairy products uh, to the EU. Perhaps one, uh, Nicholas, I'll, Nicholas, Hannah, I'll leave you to, to decide which one's going to answer this. Um, what are the rules around dairy products being exported to the EU and what documents are required? Yeah, I mean, it's tempting to just read out uh, from gov.uk. I've got to say that a lot of the time, you know, that's what we would do. 
um, for product specific questions like that. But very generally, before you can go into that, you have to ask yourself, am I really exporting them or are I just carrying them with me on a trip? Because there's a ban on dairy products going into the UK, as we saw with those poor old lorry drivers getting their lunch confiscated. Um, so that doesn't work at all. If that's with it, there is an exception to that, which is powdered infant milk, because that's considered a necessity. Even then it has to be less than whatever it is, two kilograms. Um, and when you get into export, then there's a whole range of rules you need to follow. So first of all, you've got the food labeling uh, to show the country of origin. Um, the, I mean, it goes without saying that you need the AORI number to export as well. Those are the general things. As you dig down into specific rules for dairy, um, there's so much. So, for example, you need to ensure qualitatively that the dairy product matches the EU requirements, uh, the right protein level. At the moment, that's not an issue because our protein requirement is obviously we've just inherited it from being in the EU, so it's considered harmonised. Um, but you know, this is there's no point waiting for them no longer to be harmonised. You need to ensure that that's still the case, and the, the quality will need to be the market standard inspections that um, you know are, are going to take place. So as the goods go in, there will be that inspection which there wasn't before. Um, you know, we could go on, but but as I said, whoever's asking that question might want to just get in touch with us so we can simply send the guidance because I think there's there's far too much detail in terms of what certificates are needed than can be sort of answered in a discussion. Yes, I, I mean, I, I would make the point, um, Nicholas, that if you've got, if any of the attendees have got specific questions like that, then um, yes, they're welcome to contact the panel afterwards. And um, many of those sort of inquiries may well benefit from funding available from um, the Growth Hub um, to, to obtain that advice. I can see there are a number of questions uh, for one particular business in the uh, Q&A, which I can see, which um, they may want to contact us to um, follow through on, on some quite specific and nuanced questions relating to them and their particular um, industry. Conscious that it's anonymised, I, I obviously don't want to name names, etc. or give too much detail, but um, we would be happy to talk, talk those questions through with you in detail um, offline afterwards. But one, one question there that is in the mix there, which is quite interesting, is um, they've had Norway and Iceland uh, on an approved exporter list um, for UK preference countries. Um, and the question is, following the um, trade and cooperation agreement, um, have those terms changed or are there extra barriers to trade now with Norway and Iceland as a result of the, um, the trade and cooperation agreement? No, um, there, there are not extra barriers to trade with with Norway and Iceland. And actually, as, as you know, Robert, we have a hub. You know, one of the HCR hubs is in Oslo. So yes, I wondered if you with, might touch on that. Can't help but plug that. Um, yeah, they, so our colleagues in Oslo help us with that kind of thing. Um, but there haven't been any significant problems. And the other interesting thing is just, again, I think the politics of all this is so important. The entities that we deal with, it varies within the EU, depending on, I mean, I'm going to say this, it, it, emotion takes such a big role in this, depending on the mood of the customs people you're dealing with um, and how we could be in a situation in 2021 where it's not just all process driven and systems driven, but it, but it does depend on the actual political bent of who you're dealing with. And obviously Oslo, um, there, there hasn't been any change in their attitude to us and there hasn't been a regulatory change that's made things more difficult. If people have found something different because we're learning all the time. We learn from mm. our clients who are the ones who are actually sending goods into the EU. So it's all very well for the likes of me and Hannah and Robert uh, to say, oh, you know, this is all going to be fine. And then it turns out it's not. Uh, then we, we need to know about it. We need to, to understand why that is. From a regulatory point of view, there shouldn't be issues. Okay. Hannah, anything that you want to, you want to add to that? No, nothing to add on that point. Okay, thank you. Um, and in, another interesting question, which I think goes goes to the germane point about country of origin rules. Um, so um, in this case, uh, the issue is rolled metal foil um, being purchased from a Greek mill, but the Greek mill took the slab of metal from Russia before it was rolled. Um, uh, and, and then, of course, the Greek mill of... of um, 
coiled the product and converted it. So um, in that scenario, what's the origin of that aluminium foil? Well, you know, we deal with aluminium foil rolled all the time. No, um, so I, I'm afraid, you know, again, you would have to look specifically at what the rules of origin are for that type of product that is available on Europa. Um, so we've, we had to deal, you know, better example is fridges. We had to deal recently with fridges going to Sweden and you get into great detail about which is the particular part that allows it to satisfy the rules of origin. For that, it sounds to me as if that probably isn't, arguably isn't a Greek product, but I don't know because perhaps that the, the rolling of it and converting it into rolls of foil is the magic that makes it the product. You would need to check that. Sorry, I, can't be more I think that I think there, Nicholas, that's the interesting point about about these rules, isn't it? Is is that actually it's the analysis that has to be undertaken against the backdrop of the individual rules for that type of product. And I think that that example, to my mind, very neatly summarises the the issues that lots of our attendees will have today, and the need for them to take further advice on their particular subject. And I picked the question out not because you're an expert on um, metal foils, but because I think it's quite a neat example of of how the issues have to be analysed, interpreted, and then advised. Well, actually, we, we did do some work on rolled metal um, on an anti-dumping case a very long time ago. Uh, but yeah, so great expertise in that, but no idea how you would classify the rule of origin. Okay. Um, so um, another one of our attendees this morning has um, a D to C business um, which is um, selling clothing that's made in um, China. Um, it's imported then into a warehouse in the UK. Um, and the question is, um, do they pay duty again if they sell into the EU? They do, yep. They'll have to pay duty. Um, that's that's not going to satisfy the rules of origin, so. Okay, so that's, that sounds like a, a follow-up question there from um, that particular attendee to um, have, have, a, have a look at. Um, well, I think that, that what, so what's, a lot of companies that are doing that, trying to act as distributors, are being steered towards having a distribution or having a distribution uh, within the EU to avoid exactly that situation. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, uh, an interesting question here um, from another of our attendees. Um, they have a small business um, uh, which sends out small parcels, typically up to £200 in value, and that goes to the EU uh, every day. Um, although they've had to stop um, as a result of Brexit because of lack of clarity around the duties, the VAT and the taxes, etc. Um, they send goods out by Royal Mail um, and they use the Royal Mail CN22 uh, custom forms. Um, the question they've had, the question they've got is, and um, they make their craft kits, um, which are items that come up, come from all over the world. Um, can they say that the country of origin is the UK? Mm. So I'll take that question if I can. Um, Thanks, Helen. I think there were, you again need to look into the specific products and what the rules of origin are for those products and analyse that against against your processes. But um, I would say there is a um, one allowance for small packages of things is that their proof of origin is not required for shipments of less than 500 euros. So that would relieve a huge amount of administrative work that's required for those processes so that should hopefully make that easier okay thank you thank you for that hannah nicholas we, we wanted yeah. to add some more to that um not to that one but thinking further about the um the business that is effectively distributing clothes that made in china um we didn't touch on bonded warehouses or customs warehouses whatever you want to call them um you know that would avoid the problem because effectively they're not going through into UK customs territory. So then you wouldn't be double paying because you wouldn't be paying on the UK side at all. You'd only pay when it crosses the border or crosses the customs border that is. So I think um, customs warehouses, which I'm sure 
the uh, the person asking the question be aware of. But yeah, that that's to clarify my previous answer where I said you'd be double taxed. Okay, thank you. Um, turning to the subject of Northern Ireland, which Nicholas touched on on one of his earlier um, replies, and um, uh, the, the, the comment is, is that Northern Ireland uh, is a thorny issue when it comes to um, the trade and cooperation agreement. For those of you that were watching Sky News last night, there's a section there about um, importing, exporting rose bushes into no no Northern Ireland. So um, the reference to being a thorny issue is, is, is quite apt. Um, uh, the question is, do the um, country of origin rules apply to Northern Ireland in, uh, in the same way as the EU? Um, and, and a follow on question for that, is it, if duties charged, can it be reclaimed? Yeah, OK. Hannah, do you want to have a go at that since you've been dealing with both Northern and Southern? Yeah, so generally speaking, the rules of origin requirements for Northern Ireland are very similar to those to the EU. Um, they're only required for goods that are at risk of entering the EU customs union, but that's defined very broadly, so it will cover almost anything, any commercial goods. Um, so yes, the rules of origin do need to be considered for, for Northern Ireland. Um, customs duty, um, they can be reclaimed if, the, um, if you're paying them on import and then you make a claim for preferential tariffs afterwards, um, you can then reclaim the duties within three years of um, of moving the goods to Northern Ireland. Okay. Thank I would you. add to that the, um, um, you know, because I think the reason that we've had such a different response from the two revenue systems, so Irish revenue on the one hand and uh, HMRC's branch in, in Northern Ireland um, than the customs in Northern Ireland, uh, there's a political difference, obviously. I mean, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you're part of the United Kingdom, on the other, you're not. And so, you know, this is all anecdotal, but when we've been dealing with Irish revenue, we've been told things like, well, you guys were the ones who decided to leave the EU. So I don't know why you're coming moaning to us. And it's very hard to bring it back down to a more analytical level and just say, uh, because they're under pressure. You know, the British businesses are sometimes very unfairly having a go at customs officials in different EU countries. And so they res respond in a similar way, in a similar vein. And we're getting much less of that with Northern Ireland. It's much more cooperative. And of course, Westminster can, to a certain extent, uh, try to resolve things in Northern Ireland, but there's no way we can do that with a sovereign country, which the Republic of Ireland is. There's, um, there's obviously been a lot of um, political um, discussion in these last few days between uh, Arlene Foster, Michael Gove, the Prime Minister, and then Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and I, I think there's a meeting scheduled isn't there, for next week with um, the EU President and the Prime Minister. Do you see the situation in Northern Ireland changing, Nicholas, as a result of those discussions? Do you think there'll be, be any movement in the, in, the, in the rules and the application of the rules? What I think is, I mean, that's, that's a re really good point. But I think in addition to that, we've seen a slight change in the way that um, Southern Ireland, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland has um, responded. It's, it's worked out well in that the um, attitude of the European Commission out of Brussels, uh, that really brought Southern and Northern Ireland together in a way that they hadn't been before. They were both with one voice saying they did not um, agree with the um, EU's overall stance on how things should be dealt with over these over these sorts of issues. So that was actually quite positive. And I think um, also over that last month where you had all the rancor at the beginning when nobody knew what forms to have, you know, now in Dunleary, they do have the right forms in place, which they didn't have before. So that was actually their fault, but they quickly resolved it. Um, and then as to Northern Ireland, yeah, I think it is, uh, Michael Gove was told off for saying it was a teething process, but, but I think in a way he was right. You know, there, yes, there are issues with um, the way the TCA was drafted and it's difficult to implement around the EU and perhaps there are fundamental problems with it. But what we've observed mostly is that they're not fundamental problems so much as problems of operation. So it's the people on the ground not having the right kit to deal with the issues they've got. And I think Northern Ireland, yeah, absolutely, I agree with you, Robert. I think that that will become much easier and it won't necessarily. So the implication with the politicians is Politicians want to big themselves up and make it because if I'm solving it, I'm having a meeting with Arlene Foster, this is all going to be great thanks to my meetings with people. The reality is, I think, more boring, which is that it doesn't matter what meetings those guys have, people will simply get used to the new procedures. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think uh, watch this space, how that whole political discussion evolves over the course of the next few days and weeks. Um, a question about second-hand goods now, perhaps one for, for Hannah to pick up on. 
Um, if an item is secondhand and bought from country X, um, and yet was originally made in country Y, which country should be entered on the, on the certificate of origin? So I would expect that it is, um, it's the rules of origin would apply in the same way as other goods. So it would be about where the manufacturing takes place. If they're imported into the UK and then so additional processing carry, is carried out here before they are exported, then that might be enough to be for them to be considered UK or <clears throat> originating. So it all depends on on the makeup of those those products and the processing that's carried out. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's again a question of looking at the rules and analysing that against the, the facts of, of that particular product. But um, but yeah, I, I just thought that the rules of origin apply in the same way to second hand goods as, as okay. any. As you as you're touching on the the um, the rules of country of origin, uh, one of our attendees asked the question whether it's sufficient to look up a product on the government uh, website Gov UK. Um, and, and rely upon the website or whether they do need to check the country of origin rules. Yeah, I would say that, and I know Nicholas has mentioned it before already, um, the UK government website is really, really useful because you can find out a, a product's commodity code and check the rules that apply to that. So it will set out any additional documents that are required, like we were talking about dairy products earlier. Um, it will also set out the tariffs um, so you can make that analysis of whether it's worth claim a preferential tariffs or not. Um, it will also set out the rules of origin that apply to that product. And as I mentioned before, they, they vary so much between different types of products. Mm. So you can then assess, it won't tell you, you know, the details of whether your product um, satisfies those rules of origin, but you can then assess whether, um, whether that it works. Um, but you will need to consider the rules of origin in relation to that product specifically as well. Okay, um, Hannah, another question for you, if I may. Um, somebody's commented, one of our attendees has commented that um, trading to the USA uh, for retailers has a threshold before duties are charged and asked the question, um, is there a similar threshold for the EU? Um, and then one of our other attendees commented, picked up on a comment that you made that um, shipments below um, 500 euros do not require um, proof of origin. Do you want to just expand on, on, on your, your comments about that and, and talk us through the rules in that area? Okay, so uh, firstly about thresholds. Um, so I think Boris Johnson was like very vocal about how the, the trade deal was tariff and quota free. And, and as we've mentioned, that's true, but only if they satisfy the rules of origin. So only for those goods that are considered originating. So there's no quotas for originating products, but if they're not originating, if they come from third countries, there, there may still be quotas. And again, it's a case of checking the rules that apply to that specific product. Um, in terms of the, um, the allowance for low value goods, so less than 500 euros, um, that, um, that means that you can um, self-declare self the, the origin without having to comply with all the formalities, such as having the statement of origin um, and all the supporting doc documentation for, for just small value uh, consignments. Okay, thank you. Nicholas, anything, anything that you want to add there about um, shipment um, thresholds and, and related issues? Yep, I mean, one other thing is there is a de minimis uh, requirement. I mean, Hannah referred to the dollar value or the EU, the euro value. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, you are allowed to bring stuff with you as you're going on a trip to Europe. And then there are certain limits that are required for that. I referred to the two kilogram limit for foodstuffs and so on. And there are others where you are allowed to bring business samples with you as well. Okay, all right, super, thank you. Um, the questions are, are coming in thick and fast. And um, another question, um, how do the new arrangements affect UK supplied software as a service, um, which is consumed within the EU? Moving away here from, from products to services. Yeah, well, services famously were not part of the TCA. Um, so we are no longer part of the, um, you know, the e-commerce directive and other things. If you're providing software as a service, then, you know, there, there's all sorts of definitions as to how that works, whether it's uh, assuming it is for payment. Um, 
can customers use the service without the provider actually being there? Um, is it at the request of the recipient of the service? So that covers the vast majority of, of online service providers. You do need to check where your service is based. So, you know, you need to identify the, the place of establishment for where you are and the fixed establishment where your uh, economic activity takes place. And then that's also got certain definite periods of time that apply to it. Um, all these things will be relevant as to how you are tariffed for doing that, or whether or not you, you even are going to be taxed. And then in addition to that, there's other regulatory aspects to it. So again, because we've no longer subject to the um, e-commerce directive, we're going to be subject to prior authorization schemes. So there could be licensing requirements. And then, and that's in the, uh, you know, whichever EU country where you operate. That is, you know, once again, sort of without going into enormous detail on it, um, the categorization is helpfully provided on europa.eu, uh, which is again, is our crib sheet for anything technical and non-legal, sets out in enormous detail how that all works. Um, then you've got to think about things that might actually, you know, not be even permitted. So certain types of gambling activities, you're no longer going to get a waiver and assumption that you're not doing that. And you've got to worry about your personal data, GDPR, prove that you're complying with all that. So lots of legal requirements to look at. It's something that we would suggest um, if you're not sure what you're doing, then uh, certainly get professional advice on that. Okay, good. Thank you. How do you see that whole piece around services developing, Nicholas? Because as you say, rightfully, they're outside the trade and cooperation agreement. There's been discussion about further negotiations. And we have a number of some questions from people who are obviously providing services or people who are taking services. How do you see the, the, the services um, sector being dealt with um, going forward? Well, I'm not quite as optimistic. You know, Robert, you'll be surprised to hear this since I'm normally very bullish about these things, but I don't see a strong likelihood that there'll be a quick change to allow services to be covered. Um, that shouldn't be a death blow to companies that are providing it because we provide online services to China, the United States, India, Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, all over the place. These are countries that are not in the EU that have very strict requirements as to how you operate your business if, if you're providing online services, especially China, where there are rules even about content. And yet we somehow, somehow managed to do it. There are plenty of British companies that do this extremely efficiently. Forget about the banks. I mean, just ordinary online service providers manage to do it. And they are compliant. So I'm afraid we're just going to have to get used to treating the EU in that way. That's my view. If I turn out to be wrong and Boris magically or whoever it is creates an agreement that covers services with the EU, then fantastic, even better. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, moving on to the subject of, of repairs. We talked about secondhand goods, but we haven't talked about repairs. Quite an interesting question here. Um, if um, goods are sent to the UK for repair, and um, how are um, duties and fees avoided and minimised when the item's returned back to the owner in, in the EU? How does that get dealt with? Hannah, you're nodding there. Do you want, do you want to comment on that particular question? Um, yeah, so there's a provision in the TCA that's known as a returned goods relief. Um, and so that means that when goods re-enter the UK, you can claim relief on customs duty and VAT. Um, it should probably point out that this uh, works differently with Northern Ireland as, as most of these rules do. Um, but the, so the goods have to come back into the UK um, unaltered. So work can be carried out on them, but just to the extent that it's required to keep it in good working order. Um, so they shouldn't be substantially changed in any way. And then, yeah, if they're unaltered, you can apply for this relief. Um, I think the, the goods also need to have been in a free circulation in the UK before, before they were exported to the EU. Um, but yeah, the good news is there is relief you can claim for the returned goods relief. There's a three year requirement as well for the, um, so the goods have to be returned within three years, then they can be, um, there's a waiver, but only for exceptional circumstances then. So when we give these answers, just to be clear to everyone, I mean, that's not the be all and end all. There's always going to be in depth considerations that go with each heading. Yeah, and just one point to add, actually, if there, if there were goods that were exported or moved to the EU before the end of the transition period, so before 31st December 2020, um, you don't need to prove that it happened the exact date that they were exported. You just have to uh, show that 
the goods entered the EU before the 31st of December 2020. Actually, that whole thing about going back and forth, I mean, there is crossover between the second-hand goods that Hannah was talking about before and the um, repair exemption. Uh, I don't know which category this comes under, but the pallets and the containers and things that you use, if you think about it, you know, people always forget that that is actually a thing you're exporting, but those are generally exempt if they're being used to export goods from the UK to the EU. You have to be very careful about that though, because sometimes the same container you use to export things to, to China or Africa or whatever might not be exempt. Um, so again, there's detail around that. Right, okay, fine, thank you. Um, Nicholas, you've touched a few times on Europa, uh, and there's a few questions in the um, Q&A about, uh, about Europa. Do you want to give a bit yep. of background as to what Europa is uh, and, and how that is best used? Sorry, I just meant, um, so Europa, it's the, it's the EU equivalent of gov.uk, basically. So um, that's where you would find all the information um, of the type. I, I, to be fair to gov.uk, it's probably not quite as presented and not quite as, as user-friendly a way as gov.uk information. But that is where you would find the detail on, you know, I was talking about fridges before, uh, the composite part of a fridge and how does that work from a tariff point of view. That's all on Europa. So when I say and in, ter and in, ter and in, ter and in terms of Europa, how does that sit against uh, the gov.uk website, and 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 how do you deal with it in terms of if there's conflict or uncertainty between the two? Well, um, in theory, there wouldn't be. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they, it is it, it's supposed to be that's provision of official information. Um, then you get into jurisprudential questions about, well, is it authoritative? What if there's a case against me? Can I rely on that? Uh, but for, pub, for practical purposes, and especially for commercial practical purposes, that's where you would find the relevant information. Other, each of the 27 is required to have its own department that also does that categorization. Uh, so for convenience, one would start with Europa, but if you were, for example, only dealing with Sweden, you would look at the Swedish um, revenue or customs or whichever government department it is that regulates industry. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, Nicholas, coming back to um, services, uh, a question we had before the um, webinar this morning, um, how is banking impacted by the trade and cooperation agreement? I know it relates to some degree by services, but what are the practical day-to-day -day banking arrangements? That's interesting. I mean, I, I saw that, I think one of the questions that came in before we started this, that we saw um, last night, related to, to that situation where you're simply remitting funds from HSBC London to Santander in Spain. That's not affected. Um, you know, there may be tax issues or, uh, relating to the movement of products, but the cash itself, you know, for, before we left the EU, if, we, if we're remitting money to uh, the United States or back and forth, you just do that. You don't worry about what the banks are going through from a regulatory point of view. If you are in the banking business, though, then it's a bit different because banking services uh, have not been covered. So we're not this this passport that we talked about back in 2016, 2017, that hasn't been made available to uh, British banks. So we can no longer be a clearinghouse for the euro. That's a big, big loss. Um, so that perhaps going back to your point about future negotiations, that's probably further up the list than the online services we were talking about. That's, um, that's that's helpful. Um, a question about um, the hospitality uh, industry, um, which of course is as if life wasn't bad enough um, with the pandemic, they've got Brexit to contend with. Um, and a question around taking ingredients across the channel, meal, meal ingredients across the channel, um, as opposed to I suppose, finished product uh, um, of the actual meal itself um, or exporting um, meals. And um, what requirements do they have in, in terms of um, exporting the, the meal ingredients? And, and what about their hospitality uh, equipment and, and trailers? How do they get dealt with in the um, trade and, co and cooperation group? I'll take the second bit first, because that's easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> so We'll let you do that, Nicholas. Time is yeah, moving I mean, on, so we'll let you do that. Sure. So, um, you know, that there's an exemption. If you're going over there for a a conference 
There's that thing called the, the carnet or the carnet, um, the, um, the AT carnet that allows you to get a temporary admission. So these are the things that are going in, coming back out again. Um, I think not all countries accept that. It's basically something you pay for. So you apply for an ATA carnet. Um, that allows you to bring commercial samples to whichever country it is for a trade fair or an exhibition. And you're allowed to bring your professional equipment as well. So if you've got a trailer or a bunch of signs and all that stuff, the, the stuff that goes with a trade fair, um, that's how you get around that. And then great, tariff free, you don't have to worry about that. You've got to bring it back out again. Um, most EU countries, as I said, do do allow for that system. So that's the that's the easy side of the question. And then the slightly more difficult one, of course, Hannah, I'm sure you'd love to look at that. Oh, sorry, I would, I would add that, you know, we've already touched on this in a way when we talked about dairy, the meals, ingredients, um, if it's just stuff you're bringing with you that, that uh, on your trip, that's okay. But remember that fruit, dairy, about products of animal origin and uh, most fruit and vegetables are banned and that includes dairy. So you would have to be an exporter to bring that into the EU. I'm conscious that um, time is moving on and, and we've got very, very little time, time left. And I think rather than go into it and some of the more specific detailed questions, which we're happy to pick up afterwards uh, offline and indeed may be uh, able to be supported by the uh, Growth Hub uh, with funding and particularly really, really detailed questions. And um, I thought it might be useful um, for our attendees to hear from each of you what you think your top three tips would be for trading with the EU under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And Nicholas, what would, your, what would be your three top tips to um, our attendees today? Well, unfortunately, I think tip, tip number one is you've got to do an enormous amount of work making sure you do have all the right documentation. Um, you can't just hope for the best. Um, not suggesting that people would do that but with our own eyes we've seen companies get into trouble because they've done exactly that that they've thought well the europe europe needs our product so politically and commercially of course it's going to be fine and we now know you know one month in that that's not the case so there's all that homework that's um tip number one from me and actually I'd, as well as hannah i'd love to hear from toby uh, on, the, on this point because i'm sure toby's got he's keeping very quiet there but i know that he's going to have some really good ideas Anna, do you want to so, that, so that was your that was your first tip, Nicholas. What what about your other two tips? Okay, um, so it's three tips each, right? Um, yeah. So in addition to doing all that homework, I would say, you know, com companies that have already been exporting outside the EU are in a better position. They already understand what export means. Um, so, but I would suggest that you, know, you you kind of you do need to keep a level head. And it's very tempting to lash out at your freight forwarder, your DHL, or whoever's doing that, say they didn't do the work. Um, so tip number two would be perhaps to invest in getting the freight forwarder add-on service. If you're only paying your DHL to, or whoever it is, to just do the trucking, you need to be aware of that. They have no obligation, unless you've got a very expensive contract with them or a more expensive one, to do that import-export checking for you. And the, the third tip would be make uh, make use in addition to making use of you know legal advisors like ourselves who can dig into your thing but get hold of the free advice that's available too from your lep your dit and they're also sitting there waiting to be asked questions so take advantage of that and in some cases the target country the european country will also have uh, you know if you've got con if you've got an importer sitting in europe waiting for your stuff it's just as much in their interest to make sure yeah. that this works out as well so don't treat them yeah. as the enemy they're going to want to help you as well Okay. Hannah, what would, what would be your three top tips for our attendees today? Yeah, so first of all, I'd say familiar, familiarise yourself with the harmonious, harmonised system and, and your commodity codes. Um, the commodity codes are like used for everything, and we've seen clients have goods held up at the border because they have had the incorrect commodity code. So I think it's really important to, to understand what, what the ones are that are relevant for your products and use the resources available using these codes. Uh, we've mentioned many times the UK government and Europa websites that they're, they're incredible resources, so really get familiar with those. Um, secondly, I would say um, carry out an analysis on the preferential tariffs and whether it is worthwhile claiming for them. Work out how much money you could be saving 
your business by claiming these preferential tariffs and, and assess whether it's worthwhile for you to do so. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, I would say look at your at your business and, and the amount of work that's being carried out in the UK and whether this helps you satisfy the rules of origin and claim the preferential tariffs. And if there is an easy way in which you can, if you're close to that threshold, but with a small change to the way the business is carried out, whether you can go over that, that threshold and save yourself a considerable amount of money by using these preferential tariffs um, for trading with the EU. Thank you, uh, Hannah. Um, Toby, I appreciate that the uh, growth hub are not allowed to give advice in their own right, um, but um, what would be uh, your three top tips to our attendees today? You're, you're on, on mute, Toby. Beg your pardon, unmuted now. Um, yes, I, I, think, I think because the nature of the agreement was right to the last minute, um, there was a degree of last minute wait and see, and, but I think now we've moved into you know, the first phase, as it were, of, of embracing the new regulations. Um, it's important to, to reach out. As, as Nicholas was saying, um, don't wait for the best. Just be proactive, reach out. I mean, there's a lot of help now. I think the seminars put forward huge amounts of information, technical as well as, um, as, as, well as guidance. So, you know, do, do come back to us, you know, with follow-on questions and things, and we can respond. From the Growth Hub, we can signpost uh, or we can direct to specific um, answers that you can give but I think that message hopefully is is, is a strong one that um, be proactive in all of this. Thank you um, Toby. Um, I'm conscious that we are um, coming up to our um, deadline um, this morning and um, we do like to keep our webinars um, on schedule. Um, I, I think um, pulling everything together this morning obviously an immensely complicated area, obviously an area that everybody's getting to grips with at very very short notice um, Toby's absolutely right. Who was going to read the um, Trade and Cooperation Agreement over Christmas, New Year, ready for the 1st of January? Um, Hannah and Nicholas probably did, not Toby too, and perhaps I did as well. Um, but actually, um, for you as businesses, you know, there's a lot to digest. And I think pulling together those um, three tips from um, Nicholas, Hannah and, and Toby, um, I think probably keep calm, do the work, um, analyze how the rules impact on you and your business, look for the support that you can take in terms of um, the government's advice, advice from, the, from the, the, your local LEPs, um, and uh, above all else, um, keep going because there are opportunities out there, real opportunities. And, and as a commercial lawyer talking to my clients day in, day out, you know, I hear some of the success stories um, that Brexit have already given to, to clients. So, there is um, lots to do out there. And um, so uh, as I wrap up, um, thank you to uh, Toby for inviting us to host the um, webinar today with um, the Growth Hub. Thank you um, for, for the invitation, that's very much appreciated. Thank you to uh, Nicholas as our international and Hannah from his team uh, for um, taking our questions today. If anybody has got any further questions that they want to ask Nicholas or Hannah, I know a number of people uh, on the Q&A asked how to contact our speakers. And um, for any of the um, HCR speakers, just take the initial of their Christian name, followed by their surname, and then at hcrlaw.com. So I'm rkappa at hcrlaw.com. Um, otherwise, ring um, our main switchboard number, 01905 612 001 and we can easily um, divert people to the necessary um, bones. And I'm sure Nicholas and Hannah would be more than happy to um, take your questions and to um, field them um, for you. And also then a plug for the, the Growth Hub. Um, Toby touched on it just now. Um, there are lots of um, support available from the uh, Growth Hub, including funding for advice, whether it be from lawyers or accountants to help you through the country of origin rules and also your wider Brexit uh, queries too. So please um, get in touch um, with Toby and the team there at the, um, at the Growth Hub. Um, very finally from me, uh, thank you for your time today. I hope you found the uh, webinar helpful. We will be sending after the event this morning an email um, with a link to our Brexit Hub. It's got lots of uh, resources, articles, videos, etc that you will find useful. And then in the next few days, we'll also send you um, a link to um, 
a recording of this webinar so um, you can watch it all again. Um, but uh, in the meantime, thank you very much and um, good luck with your exporting to the EU. Thank you.